This is the Drummers Only Podcast, brought to you by the UK's leading drum store. Hello, Drummers Only Radio Podcast. I keep doing that, Drummers Only Podcast, we changed the name. Episode number 68. It's really exciting because we haven't filmed a live in person one, and we have a live in person. I'm a living person. He is. Yes. Mr. Chris Allison's with us. Hi, Chris. Hey, Chris. How are you? I'm v- really good. How are you? I'm fantastic, man. Thanks Excellent. so much for having me. Thanks for being here. Of course. Um, Chris is on tour with Pliny, uh, playing all over the UK, and took some time out of his crazy schedule to come into our humble shop and talk some drums. So yeah, man. Um, we thought we would do that. So if you're new to Chris, um, shame on you. Um, <laughs> but check out Pliny. Um, who is an Australian uh, instrumentalist touted as like the next Vi uh, and Chris is uh, on his, is his touring drummer and he's recording drummer has done two records with him uh, and countless tours Chris also has his own fusion band called Instrumental Adjacent Adjective Adjective damn it no, that's damn fine it. that's fine um, you don't I, need to listen to that anyway I, so. I did listen to it it's great oh you did yeah, oh my god I'm so sorry yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, he has a believe it or not a band called Birdman and the Unexpected Virtue of a Tony Hawk Pro Skater cover band, which, as you can uh, uh, hopefully assume, is a cover band of the Tony Hawk Pro Skater soundtrack. Correct, the first four. First games, four. Yes. Uh, and they are so good that Tony Hawk had them come and play at his charity. Yeah, so we, he flew us out to San Diego in 2019, uh, which was the 20th anniversary of the first game coming out. So he put on a, a, an event. Uh, to celebrate that, and uh, his initial thought was to get every one of the bands on the soundtrack to come in and do the gig and just play one song, and then obviously realize that's a logistical nightmare <laughs> uh, and would be extremely expensive yeah. to do. Yeah. Uh, and we kind of just been gigging around Sydney, uh, doing some some festivals and stuff like that. And uh, he called wind of us through light social media harassment um, and constant tagging sometimes does work apparently and uh, he he sent us an email saying can you come over and do this thing and you'll be supporting he he did have bad religion play um, so we we just opened up the show and uh, which was pretty wild and you know he took very good care of us and it was kind of weird to be in the presence of someone that was you know a household name for is a household name and uh couldn't have been a lovelier guy, really. I mean, actual legendary status. Yeah, like absolutely, and and you know he, uh, we have a, a distinct honour of being uh, the the first band to play. He sang with us, right? So it's the first time he sang on stage. Oh wow! Ever so, uh, which was kind of wild. So he got up with us and sang uh, the first song that he, the first song he skated to in a professional competition, which was. Uh, Amoeba by the Adolescents. So he chose that song to p- sing with us because it was the first, when he first competed as a wow. young kid, that was the first song he skated to. So it was amazing. Like, yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, wild. yeah. That's, that's like one of those kind of um, weird things you didn't even know was on a bucket list, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It was definitely, I was not thinking one day I'm going to meet Tony Hawk yeah. and, and, and. Do you skate? I do. I skated very, very minorly as a, as a kid. Uh, uh, I stopped. Pretty much after the first day, I tried because <laughs> uh, I had a comical, uh, <laughs> comical fall where I was going down a very slight incline, and the, the board just went out from under me, and I did the full oh, uh, cartoon geez. kind of thing where <laughs> landed on my tailbone and went. I kind of like being able to walk. Yeah, uh, yeah I think I'm going to yeah. just stick to my feet. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, can't play drums with a broken spine. Yeah, no, not to my knowledge, <laughs> anyway. Um, so yeah, I I I don't skate, but I uh, was part of. I ingested a lot of the music as a, as a teenager. So, yeah, because um, that's a whole culture, right? Yeah, particularly where I grew up, which is just north of Sydney on the central coast. It was had a very strong kind of um, skate culture there. Mm-hmm. So I grew up listening to a lot of the skate punk bands of the, you know, 90s, early 2000s. So mm-hmm. bands like Strung Out and, and Bad Religion, yeah. and if you want to call them skate punk, but um, Mill and Colin bands yeah. of, of that kind of ilk. Which, and- Exactly, yeah, yeah. and uh, all all the bands that kind of made up those soundtracks. So, you know, when uh, the Tony Hawk band kind of came about, 
I didn't have to learn any of the songs because oh, they were just in the back of my mind from 20 years ago sort of thing. So um, so it's a, it was a pretty easy gig to kind of get into. Yeah, it's funny how, like, if you're presented with that music you grew up around, you can just, it's just a switch, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. You just kind of turn it on and it's there. It's like, you know. listen to the song once and it's like, oh, I, I literally know every single note of what's going on yeah, in this yeah, song. Yeah, totally, I, totally. Yeah. Um, so you, you come up with that kind of sort of um, that kind of punk ethos. How do you take that with you into what you're playing now? Because the music you play now is wildly different. Yeah, it's not very skate punk. Uh, I mean, it has an attitude though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess maybe that's the only part of it that kind of translates. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, there's not, uh, that's just something that's kind of um, in the back of them, you know, um, vocab, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so not a lot of that translates into what what i do at the moment um uh which is fine uh but yeah t totally was it a uh, was it a conscious decision to sort of move away from playing that way or is it just kind of how it worked out or i wasn't very conscious right. um i just became exposed to more music mm. um so yeah. growing up on this on the central coast like there like i said there was a strong kind of skate culture and um a lot of local punk bands so it's just what i was surrounded by yeah, like, yeah. Um, and what all my friends are into so um and then when i finished high school and i went and i studied music right um all of a sudden i'm listening to jazz which yeah. is was never going to be on the cards <laughs> otherwise so um so i got exposed to a lot more music and then just my ears you know um developed a, a a certain palette for for new things and and a wider palette i should say um and it kind of just went from there so it was not a a, a conscious decision it was just kind of that's how it played out through through exposure basically ah, okay so where did you study so at the institute of music in sydney right um so i did a i think it was three years i was there mm -hmm. um uh it's turned into a bit of like a behemoth of a of a, of a school oh really um uh but uh, it was a, a bit smaller at that time, but yeah, no, it was um, a big learning experience, like a big eye-opening learning experience. Yeah, I remember going and being like, oh, everyone can play. Sure, yeah, there's definitely that, and, and you know, uh, I've got to really pull my weight to make yeah, sure totally. that uh, I'm keeping up or, or anything like that, yeah. We, uh, when I was at college, I had a, an instructor from, I can't remember if he was from Melbourne or Sydney, a guy called Chris Grieve, he's a trombone player. Okay. And he was like, yeah, college in Australia was brutal. You got like two goes at an assessment and if you didn't pass it, you were gone. Sure, You know, sure. like you need to know all your scales, all your modes and you get tested regularly, like real hardcore. Yeah, uh, my school wasn't that hardcore. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, yeah, all particularly all like the harmonic theory yeah. stuff, which is, you know, so um, not part of the drum set vocabulary at all. No. That was the hardest part to to keep up with like making sure I could pass a, an oral exam and, and hear the, hear yeah. all the different pitches and, and, yeah. and, and, and intervals and things like that. Like that was a big struggle. That was the biggest struggle for me. With yeah. I found stuff. it as well. Uh, your training exam, we would get chord clusters hit right at the top of the piano and it vanishes like that. Oh. These, <laughs> these notes just go into the air and you're like, ah, oh. yeah. Yeah, I'm just gonna throw some num yeah. some names at you. Here. And, and yeah, you can yeah. see all the harmonic guys just going, yeah. and you're like, ah, oh, yeah, help. help. Yeah, you know, exactly. or like down the lower register where it gets swampy and muddy and you mm -hmm. can't hear anything. Yeah, it's really hard. Yeah, not of a, all of us are Rick Beato's son. No, yeah. totally, yeah, yeah, totally yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you just kind of figure it out, I guess. Yeah, I think you have to. You end up spending. I don't know about you, but you end up spending more time on that than playing drums. Oh, 100 percent. No, I to in order to get through it all, I had to spend a lot of time on a keyboard, just yeah, hitting things and and making oh, sure I can keyboards. hear it. And yeah. and uh, like we were also doing like sight singing and things like that. Soulfish. Um, yeah, 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 and that was um, that was the most brutal one because you know being able to hear something is one thing, being able to sing it, uh, very, very different. And uh, I remember I I barely scraped through one of the kind of last exams, and then the, I worked really hard on it. And yeah. the last exam that I did of that, the um, assessor was just like, "You'd be surprised to know that you actually did probably some of the best to, today out of anyone." And oh, I was wow. kind of like, "Oh, wow, okay." I don't have any of that skill now, uh, but, but I was like, okay, hard work paid off there for yeah. that. Yeah, drummers get a raw deal though, because ain't nobody doing rhythmic studies like that. No, no, the rhythmic studies stuff that we had to do, so there was some sight reading rhythm, rhythmic stuff as well, 
it was not uh, oh. anywhere near as intense. And uh, but that's just the raw yeah, deal we cop as drummers, totally. I suppose. You know, yeah. I mean, no one else has to play in time. No one ever. Well, know, yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it gets a bit soapboxy. Um, do you still? Like, do you still use any of it? Do you maintain any of that stuff at all? Uh, not as much as I'd like. Do you compose? Uh, not as much as right. I was like, as, yeah. I, as I would like, sorry. Um, yeah, that's always something that, that it's in the back of my mind. It's like, I need to get back into that again. Um, that's a funny one, huh? Yeah, and then all of a sudden something comes up and yeah. I have to put it on the back burner. Yeah. Like, um, I've got to be able to prioritize things yeah. and, and that's further down the list then making sure I'm on top of my stuff for a tour with Pliny or something yeah. like that. Yeah, so. and it's not a very, um, it's not a very natural habitat necessarily for a drummer. No, well, particularly not me anyway. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm the same. And we, we were forced into it. It was like, we had to compose every week. Sure, wow, okay. So like, here's a new skill. Right. And, he, and it, we were given um, parameters. Sure. It's got to be X, Y, Z. It's got to be in this key and it's got to modulate on the bridge, which has to be in five. You know, wow, it, that's very specific. Yeah. It was, yeah. and I really liked actually. I, I, I enjoy composing that way because I, I don't have the vocabulary to do it another way. Sure, no, I, well, yeah, that's interesting to hear because I, I think I would thrive more working with inside the confines of being told what to do. Mm -hmm. It's like trying to come up with drum parts or mm -hmm. something like that for a song. Like, I always feel like if I give myself strict rules, I can be a lot more creative than if I just say, you know, play anything. Yeah. Then it's like, well, I can. You can literally play anything. Um, yeah, whereas, and, yeah, it's interesting. Well, I think if you if you if you come at it with I can play anything, you'll just default. Sure. Yeah. You'll exactly. come back to the stuff you know oh, and, and play all the time. Absolutely. Whereas if you do have strict confines of like, okay, you can't play any crash cymbals here or something. You just yeah. simple little rules like that. All of a sudden, you have to approach everything very very differently. Yeah. So talking about that, how do you come up with? parts for the music you're playing now I, I mean I've, I've looked a little bit at your watched your lesson on Sunhead sure sure if you haven't checked out guys a really great YouTube video of Chris explaining how they play in like 29 and, and, and 31 it's kind of wild but how do you come up with parts inside that framework uh, well I actually give myself lots of rules all the time right so um, yeah because it's not um, uh, easy music necessarily no. like like <laughs> Um, not that I don't want to make it out like numbers are the the only thing there, but yeah, it's it's just trying to make twenty nine feel good. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's kind of the challenge. So it's just like, okay, do I want to make this feel? So for example, with a song like that, there's two approaches, which is I kind of stole from kind of Gavin Harrison, mm -hmm. which is to either ma make it as smooth as possible and and make it really um, kind of hide the the odd meter. Uh, yep. or be really jagged with it and really kind of um, force the odd meter right. uh, and make it feel jagged, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so that that's the kind of approach I generally think about. It's like, okay, what – and that, you know, contextually depends on what's happening in the music yeah. around that. Sure. So if the music is quite angular, then maybe I want to play that way too, mm -hmm. whereas if it's less angular even though it's in 29 um <laughs> maybe i want to make it as smooth as i possibly can yeah so. what's impressive about it is there's a it certainly feels like when you listen to it that there's a lot of freedom inside it there's a lot of um you can create motion without being sort of tied to beat one yeah well that's good to hear yeah that's that's something that i um thought about a lot um you know when i was working on odd times and to me like the king of odd times is, is Vinnie Coliuda. Mm -hmm. Um, and I heard him in like a bootleg clinic on an MP3, you know, uh, House of Drumming. Yeah. House of Drumming. Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, and he talked about his, how he didn't want to be tied to beat one and mm -hmm. he would work on, you know, um, hitting the E of beat four in a bar of seven mm -hmm. and being comfortable with that. So yeah. that approach was like, okay, yeah, I don't, it kind of gave me the, this idea of like playing an odd meter and playing inside of an odd meter. Yeah. So it's like um, when I first heard, heard odd meters, it was like through dream theater. Right. Okay. Um, and to me, that's playing an odd meter. Yeah. They're doing the same thing kind of every time. Yeah. And it's, there's nothing wrong with that approach. But when you listen to someone like Vinny, who's incredibly free, mm -hmm. like you said, inside of an odd, odd meter, that was more appealing to me. So it's like, okay. I want to have a little bit of that in my in my playing. So 
that's how I kind of think about it. There's playing an odd meter and playing inside an odd yeah, meter. I get it. And I think some of the music that you're playing right now has enough space for you as well. It feels like almost like it's target points. Sure. No, that's exactly right. That's the way I approach it anyway. So mm-hmm. it's like, it's not, you know, it it is complex music, but it's not like Animals as Leaders complex music no. where it's like every space is filled yeah. with, with detail and, um, and whatnot. And there, you do have to play very specific parts. Um, Pliny's music has, does have a lot more space inside of it. So it does allow for me to kind of not approach the same, like, obviously I'm going to approach it the same way because I don't want the song to change or, yeah. or feel different, but it means that I can literally on the night play it very differently to how I did the night before. Oh, cool. Cause that's what I was going to ask. Like what kind of room is there for improvisation within it? He, he's very happy for me to kind of within you know, uh, the parameters of making sure the show is good. Mm-hmm. Um, very happy for me to stretch out a little bit and, and encourages that. Like right. He prefers that when I play like that. Okay. Um, I had it in my head because from what I understand, historically he's programmed drums for, for drummers to come in and here's a, is, it, is that a framework or is that, he's not demo tied or anything? No, no, not at all. No. Right. So the first thing I did with him was the Sunhead EP, which mm-hmm. was, um, I'd only kind of known him for a little while. Right. Um, so that, that was a very different process than what we use for impulse voices. Like that was more kind of stick to what he programmed. Right. Um, with little hopeful improvements uh, <laughs> along the way and, and just making sense of, of some things. And then when we did impulse voices, um, he was like, do whatever you want. Like, Amazing. Um, so I spent a lot of time, like it was, we wrote that, well, I wrote all the drum parts in the early parts of COVID. So mm-hmm. I had plenty of time mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, up my sleeve to kind of <laughs> get creative. And so I would send him some demos of, of, of stuff and have like up to five different options oh, for a section okay. and be like, you pick which one you like the best. And then, you know, just kind of um, comp it all together through, through that way. So he was very happy for, for me to do whatever I felt was appropriate and, then when when there were options, um, he would just pick his favorite, right, and um, and go from there. But um, yeah, it, it really depends on what his idea is in the program drums. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes it's the right thing to do. So if you were to listen to that demo, it would more or less be the same for that section. Mm-hmm. Other times it was just like, no, everything about this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't make sense and it doesn't, doesn't make sense to what's going on around it. Right, so, okay. um, so it was definitely just like, yeah, it's, it's case by case, song by song, I suppose. I think that's probably the best way to do it. I think each song having its own identity. Mm, yeah, yeah. And, and he writes, well, particularly on that record, like there's a lot of different hats to, that I had to wear and, and that he was wearing as a composer, you mm. know. A song like Pan is like a very, very heavy, like mm. almost like straight up metal song, yeah. uh, which is very different to like uh, Last Call, which yeah. was like a bit more fusion-y for, mm. for lack of a better term. Um, so there's a lot of different moods to, to, to uh, play into and, and to try and um, elaborate on. So um, that also is, is a lot of fun to, to get to, you know, not just do the same thing all the time. It's like I can play more groove based things or yeah. I can play really aggressively um, yeah. as well. Um, I hate throwing um, comparisons out, but <laughs> it reminds me a lot of Tool. Sure. And what I mean by that is that it's, a, it, it's very progressive. Mm. The song makes a journey. It's, oh, it, yeah. it's not, you know, a lot of people talk about prog, and, but it's, it has a, a, you know, a relatively similar structure to pop. It's just then on time. Sure. Or it has weird changes. Mm-hmm. But this music actually evolves. It's composed. Yeah, man. Like, like the end of, is it Papalillo? Is that how you say that? Uh, I'm still not 100% uh, sure, but uh, I call it Papalillo. Right. Because uh, there's like a weird discordant thing at the end of mm. that. It, was not anywhere near the top of that tune. No. You know, and it makes this way through and it lets the, you guys play out and, mm. you know, and, and, it, and, and, and the same way that maybe I, I see Tool as creating something from nothing mm. to this explosion at the end. And yeah. there's a huge payoff. Yeah. Yeah. No, like, um, that's definitely like one of the things that, 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 um, I really appreciate about Pliny's writing mm. is that he is somehow able to, um, 
take you on a journey. Yeah, um, totally. Uh, which is not, yeah, which is in prog, like sometimes it's not the, the so that's not able to happen. It is like there, it can be formulaic. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, I was very lucky to be the first person to kind of hear these songs yeah. in the, in the early demo stages. And um, I just remember thinking that exact thing, like a song like Papalia or the glass B game, mm. even just in their demo form, it's like, Oh my God, like yeah. this is, it started here and it's ended <sighs> up here. Like, how has that happened? Yeah. And you know, um, I still don't know how it, kind yeah, of it's, 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 I'm it's, as close <laughs> to being inside of it as I, as it can be. And I still don't know how he does it. So it's, um, yeah, yeah. it's pretty heavy. And uh, melodic too which is rewarding for me because i think so much of sort of modern dance music is missing a melody it's yeah well that's that's the you know when i first started playing with pliny and and touring with him that was always the feedback is there's there's this space to it that that's not necessarily necessarily there with with other prog um or instrumental music um uh and at the end of the day like yeah, I guess one thing that that tends to happen with with progressive music is a lot of people want to show you how good they are. Yeah, it's athletic, right? Yeah, exactly. So so it does become very dense and and very note heavy, and um, that Pliny has no interest in showing you how good a guitar player mm-hmm. is. He's interested in writing a good mm-hmm. song. Yeah. Um, and and that's priority number one. Yeah. If it happens to have some flash to it, sure. Yeah. But it's there for a compositional purpose rather than just, hey, like I'm pretty good at guitar or I'm yeah. pretty good at drums or whatever, you know, like <laughs> it's all always about the song that is at the forefront of, of everything. So it needs to make sense. And it's good to know that that is translating to, to other listeners yeah, as well. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I think that's one of the attractive, certainly it was the, the, the main attractive thing for me because I think of music a lot like that. that sure. I, I, those there's a reason happy birthday's like the most you know there's a reason why people still listen to miles sure yeah you know because the melodies are there yep. you know and, and there's a reason why perhaps more outside people have a smaller audience yep you know and, and it all oh, it's relative to what you want from your music but if you can sing it back you're on a winner it helps absolutely yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. and yep. and you look at the catalog like you look at something like i'll tell you someday and look at something like Flaneur. Sure. Like, all of a sudden we've got this just backbeat groove on Flaneur. Beautiful changes, and, and it's like, oh, fuck, this is like wildly different from the uh, opening onslaught of the record. Right? Sure. You know, like, yep. these, this band can do whatever it wants. It uh, can go <laughs> wherever it wants. Yeah, well, hopefully anyway. That's, yeah. yeah, it's and that's like one of the big challenges, but also one of the big rewarding elements is that, you know, of playing with Pliny is that, I get to wear a lot of different hats yeah. and and um, it requires a lot of um, dexterity in, mm. in, in terms of like being able to switch modes and yeah. and go from playing, yeah, like a more backbeat orientated thing to maybe playing something that's a bit more chaotic or, <laughs> or, or a bit more full on. Yeah. Um, yeah, like that's that's one of the great joys of, of getting to to play with Pliny. So how long have you been touring now? That's with, with Pliny? Yeah, it's like five weeks this tour. Uh, oh yeah, this tour we're about four and a half weeks in. Yeah. So, how do you bring that all the time? Because you've got to keep it up for the gigs, right? And on a tra- chaotic so, anyway. travel schedule. This is something we were talking. Chris and I were talking briefly on the way over about the things that you don't get taught when you're on tour, and this mm. is maybe one of them. Like every night, you still have to bring this. Yeah, like uh, to me, that's more of like a mental approach. So, mm-hmm. like making sure that I'm mentally prepared for the gig. Mm-hmm. Physically, it's there, so right. I don't I don't necessarily need to do that. Like it helps to warm up a little bit. Yeah. Um. But I'm not a very strict warmer. Like I don't have a routine. Yeah. It's just get sticks in the hand and, <laughs> and get the blood pumping. But it's just making sure that I'm I'm looking after myself enough where I can be mentally prepared. So right. not like I don't drink before gigs or anything mm-hmm. like that. I'll have a, a beer after the gig once it's all you know um, all said and done. But but yeah, I don't drink before the gig, so it just means I'm mentally ready and 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 things like that, and just making sure that yeah, it's two beers at the end of the gig rather <laughs> than having you know ten beers yeah, and yeah. then waking up the next day and not knowing where you are or anything yeah, like that. Like yeah, it's that for sure. Like I'm here to do a job, and my job is to to do exactly what you said to like bring it night after night, and um, so it's just making sure that you know I'm mentally prepared 
as best as I possibly can be. Yeah, is that a challenge of being away from home and all that stuff? Yeah, like that. That's again, like you said, like not one of the things you get taught in yeah. music school, or not yeah. one of the the kind of sexy topics about being a touring musician. Is that yeah, like being away from family and friends and missing out on important things back home. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of sacrifices that go yeah. into to being a touring musician. And look, I'm at the end of the day, I'm very, very lucky to get to be in Glasgow mm. tonight to play to play a gig. Uh, when I'm from Sydney, Australia, like I shouldn't be on this side of the world <laughs> playing music. Um, so I'm very, very um, eternally grateful to do that. And I always keep that in the forefront of, of my mind is that I am lucky to, to, to be here to do this. But there is that sacrifice. And, yeah, sure. And, and, and that is the, you know, you, you just hope that the shows are, are going well and, and that you're playing good and you feel good about everything and that kind of makes up a little bit for that sac those sacrifices. Yeah, man, I, I get it. I, I think from what I've certainly seen via the internet, it looks like you're having a, a pretty good time, um, you know, and, and Glasgow's a good house. For having a good time? Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. Sure, so yeah. I, I'm excited to, to see tonight, actually, because I, 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 I got to you guys after you had been here last. Okay, sure. I hadn't heard the band until COVID issue, 21-ish, round about there. I think okay. actually when... Um, impulse voices came out sure. which is like oh what is this um, so it's, I'm looking forward to sort of getting to see you. I've not been to a gig in a while so oh cool man yeah yeah this is, the, this is the first one I've been to in a while and it's certainly the first instrumental gig I've been to in a while so it's it's you know you you forget that man as a musician you need to go and see stuff right oh yeah I that's something I think about all the time like I, I don't get out as much as I possibly could when I'm home yeah um, and when I do I always go oh Live music is pretty awesome. Like yeah. it's it's uh it's one of those things where it's like I'm sharing this experience with whoever's in the room with me, and it's like that's it's like going to see a movie in the theater totally. versus watching it at home. It's like it it is a different experience, and obviously it's a lot more convenient to just be at home. But um, getting out yeah. and and doing you know seeing live music is always the one of life's kind of great joys. Yeah, man. Um, Do you use it as a driver, like for your own playing and for? doing other things like going to see something gives you that impetus to then do it, more yeah it can again i'm not the best at, at always <laughs> uh, uh doing that but when i do i always have like a renewed kind of vigor for, for for music and it can be kind of like that um spark that that, that ignites some new kind of um uh, inspiration or whatnot mm. and particularly if i'm seeing maybe like a particularly good drama, like just hearing yeah. an, an interesting idea I never would have thought of. And it's like, okay, maybe I can steal a bit of that and, and add that in. And then you get excited about, you know, that new idea. And, and then that can just spill out into everything else from there. Yeah. I think that's, I think it's way more valuable than we give it credit for, you know. I 100% agree. Yeah. Certainly me, like uh, I, I, it's, it's certainly much more inspirational for me once I've been to see something, you know, and it can sort of dig you out of a rut. Or, mm. or out of a creative hole that you found yourself in, you know. Totally, and I think as well, like particularly in the in the type of music that we're playing, like hearing a record is one thing, um, but seeing it live is is always different. Like listening to a band like Periphery, like I love Periphery um, as people. Like we've spent a lot of time with them, yeah. and, they're, and they're great guys. I don't listen to their music all that much, uh -huh. but seeing it live is exhilarating. Like it's yeah. it's really amazing to watch Matt. Um, built the absolute hell out of the drums with in 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 such a beautiful way as well. It's not just you know there's a lot of detail in what he's doing, yeah. but getting to see that up close and personal is different to then listening to the record. Yeah, there's an energy you can't capture a lot of time. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Or it just doesn't translate in the same kind of way. Sure. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, so like seeing something like that live is like I'll go see them any day of the week that yeah. they're anywhere near me. Yeah. Um, uh, and and always have a good time. Yeah. Who was it for you coming up? What what guys or bands? Apart from the, we've talked about the, the punk thing, but who else was around for you that was like? Well, the earliest inspiration was Lars. Um, oh really? Wow, yeah, okay. yeah. So he he's the reason I picked up drums oh, because oh. I was like, um, uh, yeah, I just saw um, a bunch of stuff in the at the end of the nineties and stuff like that, and was big into Metallica as a as a you know younger kid. Mm. Um, so that that was the main reason. Then it was guys like Josh Freeze. Yeah, man. Um, so a perfect circle of vandals yep. um, as a teen. And then Brooks Wackerman. Yep. Um, we were talking about Brooks yesterday. 
uh, infectious groups? Uh, I never got into that. Oh, really? Um, not through, I, like I listened to him with Suicidal Tendencies. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I, 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 just, I couldn't get that CD at, oh, at yeah, home. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I didn't get to listen to <laughs> yeah. Infectious Grooves uh, as much as I probably should have. But um, uh, but yeah, like he's obviously still, oh, he just keeps getting better and better yeah, right. uh, and gets bigger and bigger. So yeah, he obviously joined Bad Religion at a point and, That's right. um, oh, yeah. and did that for a long time. But then it was guys like um, Danny Carey, Mike Portnoy. Um, and then when I started studying, it was Vinny, Weckl, mm. um, Virgil. Mm-hmm. Um, Close to home, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, Virgil was like, yeah. he was one of the first drummers, I, drummer drummers, I suppose, like um, that I listened to and I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> uh, and it took a long time for me to figure out about 5% of what's going on <laughs> in that guy's brain. But, um, but uh, yeah, so it was just drummers of that kind of ilk. And then, you know, I started to listen to a lot more jazz. So it was... Um, listening to Tony, mm. Elvin, Philly Joe, and then more modern kind of guys like Bill Stewart. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. uh, and then even more modern guys again, like Eric Harland and yeah. Mark Giuliano. And yeah, just a lot of those type of players. And then Questlove. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Hi- Hip hop, you know, Chris Dave, like yeah. kind of guys like that. Like, um, yeah. So it's just been a continually finding new drummers to be inspired by us, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, it, it is. It's, it's, a, it, it's a beautiful thing, man. It's, mm. There's so much information that you can digest and you can kind of, what's amazing now, especially with the internet, kind of making it a bit more democratic is you can you can go in whichever direction you want. Totally, yeah, you know? absolutely. And, and and that's why you, you, you're starting to see so many kind of, unique voices starting to pop mm. up again, like someone like JD Beck. Like he's I haven't checked this guy out yet. People keep talking to me about this guy. Pretty awesome man. Really? Like he's I don't even think he's twenty yet. Right. Okay, um, wow. And um he's just got this v- incredibly unique voice yeah. on, on the drum. Like it's very drum and bass kind of but free within drum and bass. Right, and okay. Just a v- weird setup too, like a really odd setup. Like okay. you should check out the um uh the Zildjian Live thing he did. Right. Okay. Um, and he just put out a record uh last year yeah last year which right. is really great too um but just like really lo-fi kind of sounding everything's lo-fi sounding oh, okay but, cool but there's so much fire and energy to what he's playing it's it's very cool so it's yeah. like he is the product of of that do- democratization yeah yeah uh, <laughs> uh of of information and music and you know he's obviously still a very young kid so um uh, adult sorry um i I don't mean to make him sound like a kid but but like he's a phenom and and um and really exciting to see that type of player starting to come through yeah for sure and you've got guys that's a josh dion yeah yep guys that are doing that thing and 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 nate wood nate wood yeah exactly freaking everybody out yeah like the first that First video that came out that they would yeah rabbit rabbit yeah yeah it was like the first like yeah Okay. This guy's on another planet. Yeah, uh, he's, well, he's taking everybody's gigs, right? He's taking well, bass players' gigs and keyboard. And, and doing it well. <laughs> yeah, and That's right. the other thing. It's like, oh, he's playing drums one-handed, but it sounds like a regular drummer. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's pretty awesome. So, yeah, you're just seeing all these new ideas coming out, which, you know, probably no one would have thought to do that mm. 20 years ago because no. you can't film it, so you can't really prove <laughs> it. Uh, so maybe that is thanks to technology. I guess we'd have to ask Nate. But, yeah, um, I mean, he's doing it with Kneebody too, so it's, it's it's not even in his own context. Yeah. It's in another context, yeah. so it's like, okay, this dude's heavy. Yes, absolutely, you know, absolutely like, heavy. Yeah. Kind of split his brain into four. Yeah, it's, like, it's wild. Yeah, yeah, and you kind of like, where do you even start? You know yeah. what I mean? Like, like if, if I want to be that guy, I'm going to be the guy that doesn't, like, no, you're not. Like, Yeah, no, I that would that would be what my brain would tell me. Yeah, uh, got, I think you've got to be wired for it. Yeah, he obviously is. Well, I know that, you know, his dad was a, a, a touring musician. So he played like with them. Kenny, Kenny Loggins or something right, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and I, he, he uh, Nate played in Taylor Hawkins' band. That's right. He played, played guitar. Right. So he obviously is quite familiar with, with other instruments outside uh, yeah. of just drums. So He also recorded that album by The Calling. Oh, really? Yeah, I, he I plays drums that. on that oh, album. Oh, wow, man, okay. Where, like, wherever you will go and all that. Nonsense. Okay, crazy. Like, yeah. yeah, just like... How is that the same dude? Yeah, you wouldn't think that that is Kneebody. No. Uh, 
or, or, or four. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's very, yeah, playing very, very like different. weird love ballads. Yeah. To then playing as outside as it gets. But it just shows the depth of him as a musician, you know? Yeah. And, and, and that's, yeah. that's the, the brilliant thing about someone like that is that they can, or someone like Vinnie Colaiuta, they can go from playing with Faith Hill or Sting to playing on a Megadeth record yeah. or playing with Zappa. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's just like, okay, that's the depth of musicianship that those kind of guys have, which is inspiring to, yeah to kind man as it, it, it's it's kind of like it's funny in it because it's the opposite of the guys that have like the keltners that have this voice and this thing sure and he's the greatest at it of course yeah. let's not play any crashes let's yeah. just in fact do you know what we're going to record without any symbols yep just play mm -hmm. and play the, the sweetest groove you've ever heard yeah you know and like just hits the floor tom once and it's just ridiculous. It's the most amazing thing you've ever heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. It feels amazing, you know. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, or like a brush and a rod and we'll just create gold. Yeah, you know? yeah. Even someone like Aaron Sterling, kind of like the modern yeah, kind of I, Keltner. Like, yeah, you know, playing for, on a bin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, or anything like that. It's just like, yeah, you have those guys that are immediately identifiable. But I guess the other thing is they can be chameleons when they want, but... Kind of, no one really wants to hire Jim Keltner to be a chameleon. It's like no. you hire Jim Keltner to do Jim Keltner That's things. It. Yeah, yeah. Know, and you know, because you're going to get magic. Well, more often than not, yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, how is the session thing for you at home? You record from home, right? Yeah, yeah. So I do, I do do a bit of that. And you've got, I feel like your discography's grown as well. I was checking it out. Um, just you know, you you doing a lot from home. Uh, it's started to pick up in the last little while. Like the, the the recording myself thing. Um was always one of those things that I said I need to get into. Oof. And then COVID did happen. It was like, well, now I have no excuse not to at least try and understand it. Not necessarily to do it for work, like yeah. to, to get work, but it was like, I want to understand what yeah. all, this, all this engineering side of things is about. So I spent a fair bit of time through, you know, the early lockdowns doing that and getting to record demos for Pliny mm -hmm. was a good kind of like a throw myself in the deep end with yeah, it. Man. And, and, um, and uh, so, yeah, so I've been doing a little bit from home. I also, um, you know, go into the studio and stuff like that as well. You're like dry hire. Or... Yeah. So like um, I work with Simon. Oh, know, Simon regularly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. He plays bass in yeah. Pliny and, and also um, mixes most of Pliny's stuff. Like okay. All the recent stuff anyway. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he gets hit up by people to do stuff. And if they don't have a drummer, he often uh, will yeah. just... You're like, hey man, come down to the studio for a couple of days and and help me out, um, uh, which is great. It's like awesome to get to do that, and it's always fun working with him. And I always learn something, particularly about engineering and stuff like that, <laughs> as well as like learning things about my own playing, which is always kind of good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that sort of consistent recording thing where you put yourself under a microscope. Oh man, there's, not, there's been nothing that I've done that's been better for my playing yeah. than, than doing that. I remember we, we had a class in that at college um, we where we had to learn to record and playing, playing a standard, I can't remember what it was, and, and the course leader was like, can like the bass player I was at college with, a guy called Jay, Chris Jay, can you come in to the, uh, the control room? Mm. <laughs> and he'd blown up, like he'd made it on the Mac, massive, the bass channel and the ride symbol channel okay. to emphasize how far out we were. Oh, okay, like, wow. Yeah, that's okay. brutal. It was a heavy and like nothing yeah. else, man. And it, what, what did you call it? There was trouble in the kitchen. Okay. Like, oh, fucking hell. Okay, right. Yep. So you just like spend an hour just playing quarter notes with the bass player just to see how close you can get. Yeah, like, how locked in you can be. Yeah. Yep. It's like, will it make a difference? Yes, it will make, absolutely will make a difference. And it's one of these things that you just, I had no idea. Yeah, no, until you like really look at that stuff and really analyze, it's like, oh, how in time am I actually playing? Yeah. Uh, there's never a more brutal lesson than <sighs> blow, blowing up the waveforms yeah. and, and looking at where you are compared to the grid. And it does make a difference. Like when, when a, a bass drum and a bass hit at the same time, yeah. yeah, that's got power to it that if you're slightly early and the bass is slightly mm -hmm. late or whatever, that's got nowhere near as much impact. So Yeah, I mean, even your bass drum and your hi-hat. Oh, of course, like, yeah, yeah. Beat one. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Just doing that on the drum set alone yeah. makes a big difference, let alone within the context of music. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Weckle thought about that. Like, everybody spends all this time trying to separate their limbs. Is anybody spending enough time trying to put them together? Sure, yeah. You know, just playing Billie Jean. Yeah. And just, like, not 
putting any space between the notes. Yeah, yeah. It's so hard. Well, that's what, like, the thing that um, Tony talked about as well is, like, the hardest exercise you can do is to play all four limbs, just play quarter notes yeah. and have them all land at exactly the same yeah. time consistently. It's harder than you think. Absolutely. Yeah. And then you get the freaks that can, that can do it ahead of the beat and the middle of the beat or behind the beat. Yeah, that's that's something that I've you know started to kind of get my head around in the more recent years, yeah. and it's it's a heavy thing to try and understand, and because then you start to think about oh you can hear uh, breadth in a click, yeah. which is really weird to kind of think about. <laughs> it's like you just think of a click as yeah. just this really short thing, but it's like oh no, there is width to that click, yeah. and you can be ahead of it if you want, behind. Uh, or, you know, as close to being over the top of it as you possibly can. And, and that cha- drastically changes the feel. And that's what someone, someone like a Keltner can do so well, yeah. is like they know how to manipulate their playing in such a way where if the chorus just needs a slight lift, just play slightly ahead. <laughs> uh, and, and they can do it in such a controlled manner. Or, or even someone like Brody Simpson, like I'd have mm. to... Um, uh, I haven't talked to him about this, but like I assume that he's pretty ridiculous with that type of stuff. Like he's so consistent yeah. and and um, everything's so intentional in his playing that he'd be able to turn that on pretty quickly um, and pretty easily. Maybe not as easy as I'm making it out, but um, but he always seems so in control. Yeah, um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. And it, and they can do it without thinking about it. Like they hear the music and go, well, it just needs to be there. Sure, yeah. And it's not even a discussed thing. Yeah. It's not like the producer and him sat down for a minute and like, I think the chorus needs to be a little faster. Yeah. They just do it. Yeah, they just naturally lean that way because they know the arc of a song. And I guess that's the other thing is like thinking of, of, of your parts within the context of the song, not just the chorus. Yeah. Rush, um, Rush Miller talked about it because he did that song, that Nelly Fittardo song, I'm Like a Bird. That's right, yeah. And he was like drummer 12 or something. Sure. And he was like, what, what did you do differently? I was like, I just hit the drums harder on the chorus. Right. I played, okay. the, I played exactly sure. the same thing. I just hit them harder on the chorus. And you're like, oh, okay. Interesting. And right. I like, hadn't heard that story before. <laughs> yeah, just, wow. The rest of us are all scratching our heads going, what? What it's have like, I done wrong? Yeah. I just hit them harder. Crazy. Yeah. Okay, lesson one, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. chorus has dynamics, you know, and it's those things you're taught when you're like six. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Some, sometimes the, the, the most obvious solution is the most obvious yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes we can overthink things and yeah, we miss it because we're like, oh no, I need to change out the ride symbol to a different ride symbol because they're not liking this one. Or maybe it is just hit harder in the yeah. chorus. Yeah. And, and you've got the answer, right? Your instincts are right. More often than not, yeah. yeah. I, I, in my experience, anyway, I definitely tend to find that the, the way I naturally tend to, uh, like, what I gravitate gravitate to more naturally is usually the right thing. Do you do you play any reading gigs? I know, like, obviously with the, the plenty stuff, and you've got you you've transcribed all that. I know you read. I don't mean that, but I mean, do you get any gigs where you're just given a chart and you've got to sort of navigate it and interpret it? Uh, not in a long time. Right, because no. I've been doing a lot of theatre. Sure, the, the, right. The, the reason yeah. I'm asking this is that the chart interpretation is much the same thing. Sure, yep. When you're given something that's been written by a copyist or, or it's been a kind of transcription of a show, and you're like, that shouldn't be played that way. Right, right, yeah, yeah. That, like, am I right? 95% of the time, you are right. Just play the music like you know how to play it. Yep. You know, yep. and sort of pull your head out of it a little and sort of... It's almost like playing it from over there. Yeah, you know that makes sense. Yeah. Um, it's a very, very similar thing. Like if you listen to any kind of cast, apart from something maybe like Hamilton, because it's super, super specific. But you yeah. listen to a lot of cast recordings, and you listen to what the drummer played versus what. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm, I, I am right. Yeah, you know, and it's just kind of trusting yourself with it. Yeah, and that, and even that is a big lesson to learn, and it's not easy to do because it, you know, totally. some, particularly if you're not getting feedback yeah. from the right. band director or whatever, saying, uh, "Yeah, no, I need this very specifically like this," or "You're doing a good job." Yeah. Uh, even something <laughs> as simple as like that, you, it's very easy to get into into your own head and be like, yeah. "No, nah, this can't be right." What I'm playing, even though yeah. it's working and whatever, but maybe this is still not the right thing. Yeah, man. It, it, can, it can be very easy to second guess yourself. Um, yeah, and and it's, then it becomes a sort of, well, it's a confidence game now. Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, and and th- and that's a thing as well. Is like playing with confidence doesn't mean you have to be arrogant about it, but like just being confident. It's like okay, 
I've been doing this long enough. Like yeah. I can make good decisions. Yeah. Um, having that sort of confidence, just lay it down. And I guess that's, you know, to go back to Keltner, playing a, a rod and a, and, a, and a brush, like you see anyone doing that uh, at a pub gig or something like that, you go, what the hell are you doing? Right. But he does it and it's immediately the right decision because yeah. he's confident yeah. that he knows what he's doing yeah. and the sound that it's going to produce and whatnot. So something there's something definitely to be said about having confidence in your in your abilities yeah, and, man. and 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 your decision making. Yeah, totally. Um do you have to bring that on, on the stage, like with things like where the time is when you're playing really dense music? Like, oh guys, here's the time. Like I know I, 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 you probably clicked live. I'm not sure. Absolutely, right. yeah, yeah. But even with that, there's still interpretation of who's got the time where and where it should push. You know, like yeah. Um, we, sorry, to interrupt, but no, you're fine. Sometimes you, you as a drummer, just have to be the boss, right? Yeah. Well, everyone is on click, so mm -hmm. I'm not just hearing the click. Everyone in the band is mm -hmm. hearing the click, so that definitely helps. Like when I first started touring with Pliny, that wasn't the case. Right. I was the only one hearing it, so right. it was just a matter of like. Here's one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys get on board with this. Otherwise, this is going to be a massive train wreck. Um, yeah, because, you know, their natural tendency might be to rush. And, and it, in a live context, it's very easy to do. Yeah, yeah it's adrenaline, yeah, totally. all that type of stuff. So, um, and I was no different, you know, like I was definitely uh, prone to rushing mm -hmm. <laughs> at the beginning. Um, but then you work on your time enough to where, you know, you can pretty solidly play without having to think about it mm -hmm. to the click. Um, but yeah, I, I've definitely been trying to lay back a lot more mm -hmm. with, with things um, over the last little while, just because I think it feels better in the right. end. And um, so sometimes it is a matter of like, no, I'm back here, guys. <laughs> yeah, like this is where I think this part should should uh, kind of sit on the against the click. And, and oftentimes it's in a heavier part. I notice that heavier things sound better back oh wow okay yeah rather than being on top because it can just sound a little bit i feel like it can sound a little messy so if i sit back i generally find those parts just sit better mm -hmm. um as a, as a unit um so again like a song like pan um which is probably the heaviest song in, in our set at the moment just really sitting back on all of that um really to me it feels a lot heavier right um I don't know if that's translating out the front. Um, <laughs> I'll text you later. Yeah, yeah, please do, please do. But um, it definitely at least feels like it sits better. Right. Pull back and then there'll be other moments in the set where it's, you know, maybe a little bit more on top because you want that energy there. Um, so, yeah, there is definitely times where I do kind of lay it down, but it's a lot more subtle than, you know, when no one was on a click and it was right. like, no, guys. Yeah, yeah. We're way back oh, really? here. Wow, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'd been talking to a sort of um, a, a local guy, customer of ours, who's, who's pretty seasoned pro and he's been around for a long time. He, he talks about even when you count the band in, count them in with an authority that oh. tells them, here it is, man. Yeah. You know what? Absolutely. No, I, I talk about that with students yeah. um, that, that, that study with me back home as well. It's like, okay, sometimes they've never played in a band situation right. or something like that and they're going into a rehearsal. And I was mm -hmm. like, okay. This is going to sound weird to do this, but I want you to count yourself in as if you're counting in the band when you do this next exercise, yeah. just to get comfortable with that idea. Yeah. And a lot of times it's like, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. it's like, uh, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I want you to just scream it. Like, yeah. don't, don't be afraid. Yeah. Like, this is a safe space. You can do it here. Yeah. I'm not going to think you're weird for doing it. Like say it with confidence and yeah. really lay it down because that's the only way that they're going to trust that you are in charge of the time. If you're uncertain with your count in, then how can they, you know, trust you with any, mm. you know, yeah, because they're going to think, oh, they're uncertain, oh, now I'm uncertain. <laughs> Whereas if you go one, two, three, and you say it with confidence, yeah. they know that it's like, okay, I can follow this person, Yeah, you know. Yeah, it's a whole thing, you know, I, I used to teach a lot, um, and I don't know if, if this is still the case, where kids aren't playing music as much now. They're playing the tracks, but they're not out. Yeah. So, so those skills are not coming naturally to them. You know, where we had to figure it out, right? We had to be in a room with people. Oh, okay, I guess I'm counting everybody in. Yep. You mm -hmm. know, because they're back, they're all looking at me. Yeah. They're waiting. For they're waiting. To for, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Oh, okay. It's like that, right? And you learn it, and then the next time you're just right. Okay. Yeah. It becomes goes. an innate kind of skill that, sure. that again that isn't taught. No. And, and and for me, it was it didn't have to be taught. Like no one had to say, "Hey, man, do this with confidence." Yeah. It was just like, 
I need to do this, otherwise this song is going to sound terrible. Oh, well, it's not going to start. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, that, that's very you know, true. Everybody's just going to be like... We won't get off the ground. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, um, yeah, so the, it, it is definitely something that I've noticed is like when I, you know, I do some online teaching and, and things like that. And there are some students who are like, I've never played music with another mm-hmm. person before. And that's totally fine. Like there's just like, obviously there's COVID to, to take into account for that. And just we're in a very different... Um, landscape them than what we were when i first started playing drums mm-hmm. like the internet is now yeah. on your phone yeah um, right. people have phones yeah. uh, <laughs> uh it's not just landlines or anything like yeah. that um so it's just a different landscape and and you know you can build a career just playing by yourself in in, in your bedroom or, yeah. or in a drum room at home and and if that's how you want to go about it then cool like it's mm. just a different way that people um can play the drums now and, and maybe make it a career or at least have a fun hobby doing it. Yeah. And um, whilst I think there's something that they're missing out on in not playing music with other people, because I, I do think it's, again, like one of life's great joys yeah. to get to do that. Um, you know, I guess you, you just got to be like, okay, that's horses for courses, <laughs> right? Yeah, totally, like, man. Yeah, um, absolutely. But it is a, I do think it, there is a, it is a shame that people aren't experiencing that because, again, yeah, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, so I, I've got two sort of questions that w- one I've been meaning to start asking people for a while, and I keep forgetting to ask it. But for you, how is it? What what's the difference now between the business of drumming and the art of drumming? Uh, for me personally, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, how do you see it, and how has it changed over your career? Uh, well, I've never been a the best business guy, anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, no, I think. I think, yeah, you, nowadays you obviously need to have some sort of social media presence mm-hmm. if if you want to get known. Um, and it's not to say that I care about whether I'm known or not because uh, uh, I, I, I honestly don't care, but um, it is important to just have something out there, it, particularly if you want to be like a session drummer like, mm-hmm. like what I do. People need to be able to see what you're doing. Sure. Otherwise, you know, it's it's not like, years gone by where it's like okay Vinnie Collier you just played on 4,000 records you can tell he's got a you can tell if you hire him you're going to be fine Um, so you know having a a social media presence is obviously pretty important um, to just get your name out there so people know they can trust you to hire you Mm -hmm. for whatever they're doing whether it be whether it be a recording gig or or just like a a gig around town or whatever Mm -hmm. Um, it seems to be that people want to see that stuff and yeah. it makes it easier than having to do an audition where you <sighs> necessarily um, you're meeting for the first time. It's like they can have an idea if you're going to be the right fit mm-hmm. musically and still do the audition. But now it's just like you need to have that video there and mm-hmm. in the first place. Otherwise, you don't you might miss out completely sure. just, just because you don't have the video. Yeah. Even if you are the right, you would be the right person. You've already missed the gig. Yeah. Just because of not having something up. Excuse me. Um, so. That's obviously like a, a massive difference than when mm-hmm. I started playing drums um, at the turn of the century. Like this, yeah. the internet has really taken over. And, 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 and again, like, like I was just saying, like you can make a career just doing YouTube covers or, yeah. or doing things like that. So it's like that was never an option yeah. um, as I, as when I was a kid and, and no one probably thought it would ever be an option. Uh, you know, yeah. like if you had, if you, were to talk to Buddy Rich <laughs> before he died about, you know, yeah. oh, in, in 40 years, like people are going to be just playing drums by themselves. Like he would have gone, you're crazy. Yeah. Like that's insane. Um, but it's now a very viable thing. And there's, you know, you just need to look at how many people are doing that and doing that successfully. Yeah. Um, it's kind of, it's kind of crazy um, to a certain degree and, and not something that we would have thought of. So um, yeah, the social media thing is a, is a, is probably the biggest change. Yeah. I mean, it's also changed like how how companies interact with you. You know, uh-huh. like in days gone past, if you were in a big band and you had a record label, you could get an endorsement. Mm. Now that, or they, you know, they advertise in a magazine. Now yeah. they don't have to do that. They do it via social media because, you know, printed media is kind of like a dying kind of medium sure. uh, uh, to a certain degree. So. You know, that's changed how businesses interact with not just artists, but also, you know, the the general public. Mm-hmm. 
um, as well. So, um, so I think it is important to be on there, whether you like it or not. <laughs> uh, which is, I'm I'm kind of like hesitantly on there. Yeah, I get it. Um, uh, but I've definitely, you know, picked up work from from b- having some sort of visibility online, right. um, and it also helps, like you know, playing with Pliny. Um, he's popular enough where you know people catch wind of me via him, uh-huh. um, like hearing his music and hearing my playing on that. And if they like what I did on that, then maybe they'll reach out and, and hire me as well. So yeah. um, that obviously helps a lot too yeah. and, and has helped in terms of like getting more recording work and, and stuff like that. Like his profile has helped mine in, 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 in that kind of sense. Like the only reason we're having this conversation now well, is yeah. through, through, through him. Yeah. So, True. um, uh, so yeah, like that, obviously I'm very you know lucky to have that as well. Yeah. Do you think you not, I mean the Royal, you end up pigeonholed is the wrong word. But a lot of your social media has come off the back of playing with plenty. Mm-hmm. People are only going to call you for that, or do they yeah. know that you do the punk thing? Uh, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, uh, all of a sudden, you're the weird prog guy when you were never the weird prog guy. Sure. No, it's definitely it, it's definitely done that a little bit, but that's also, I, I guess, I you could argue that that's um, because that's what I'm mainly sharing. Yeah, yeah I, that's kind of what I'm putting out there, even though there is another side to me that 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 does do the punk thing or do um more groove orientated things like people will probably think of me as oh that guy can play odd meters that guy can do some double bass stuff or whatever yeah um uh but no i think that's definitely the case and and whether that's a like yeah, I have mixed feelings about that, I suppose. Like, I'd, I'd like to do more varied things, like uh-huh. maybe do, like, a pop gig or something like that, like, to, or an R&B thing or something like that. But, again, people don't people don't know. I If they're, they're only seeing what I'm putting out there, which is mainly Pliny stuff, because that's, I know what, you know, people do want to see. And it's obviously a cool thing to, to do oh, as well. Course, yeah, like, yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely an odd thing. Um, and, like I said, mixed emotions. I still yeah. haven't, I still haven't got my head around that particularly at this point. Yeah. I think it's very much a generational thing as well. Like the kids have just nailed it. Yeah. yeah like all over TikTok, all over it. Yeah. All over that stuff. And they just know that, in fact, I don't even think they care about it, whether or not it's an identity for them. They just do it. It's just so ingrained and it's like Absolutely, going for yeah. a coffee. It's just, yeah. oh, coffee, man. Like, yeah. you know, it's like, yeah. I'm going to post, you know. Yeah. But yeah. like, I'm north of 40 now. So you're like, should I put that out? Right, or, right. Like, yeah, I wonder what people will think. Like, just post the video, man. Yeah, or don't just. It's just one or the other. Yeah, and if you don't post it, be okay with not posting. Sure, of course. Like, yeah. yeah, and and don't bitch about nobody's knocking the door because that's now how it's done. No, totally. Yeah, and 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 that's something that I have had wrestled with like earlier, um, but now I I'm very kind of comfortable with like I'm not going to be the social media guy. Like, yeah, I'm, yeah, right. I'm on there, but like I don't care about my numbers on the yeah. social media platforms. Um, you know, I think I, I try and my kind of philosophy is um, let the music do the talking. Like yeah. if you like the music, that's what I can do. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you hear me play on a Pliny record or on some other record, mm-hmm. um, whatever your entry point into hearing me play drums is, that's fine. Mm-hmm. And whether you like it or not, that's also fine. Yeah. Um, but that to me, it makes sense to me Um that, that that be my calling card. In a yeah, I was going to say a business card is the kind of way I see it. Is. And I think that's a healthy way to be with it. I hope so anyway, because that's yeah. the way I'm thinking about it. So. <laughs> um, uh, well, I mean, it means you're not tying yourself up in knots. Yeah. And, and look, it's not to say that I've always thought like this, but mm. over the more recent years, like it's been like, okay, um, don't take value in what other people think of you take value in knowing that you did the best work you possibly can. Let the music do it. Yeah, exactly. So like when we did Impulse Voices, like once I finished recording and I heard the finished product, I was like, job well done. Yeah. Anything outside of this, any, you know, new fans I, I personally get or Pliny gets, that's all um, icing on the cake. But, yeah. But taking, well, like I was just like, I know I did the best I could on this and, and I'm really proud of it. Mm-hmm. Um, proud of the work that I did and the preparation and all that sort of stuff. That's what I, you know, that's the joy I found in it. 
Right. Um, and then people saying nice things about it and, and whatnot and people reaching out. It was awesome, but it's like, that's not why I did it. The why yeah. I did it was yeah. to, to, you know, make, hopefully make a really great record. And, and you know, I, I think we did. Um, I, and, I did. And, and really, again, really proud of that. And, um, and that can be easier said than done. But um, sure. um, to, to, to have that kind of train of thought, but um, thankfully um, it's stuck. So, <laughs> so I, can, I can maintain that train of thought and, and, and that's, you know, translates to playing live too. Like um, just, you know, if people come up to me and want to talk to me after the gig and say nice things, that's lovely. But knowing that I am prepared and, and doing my job correctly and, and, and to the best of my ability, that's the joy I, I get out of of playing it and obviously getting to do the gig as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, playing with my, my friends and, and joking around on stage and having a good time again, nothing really beats that. So. No, no. Um, so what's next? Uh, so we, yeah, so we've got two more shows on this tour. Um, so we play tonight in Glasgow tomorrow in Manchester and then we go to the U S at the end of this month. All right. Okay. Well, wow. um, for, for a month. Um, and that's, more or less in support of Impulse Voices, which right. is three years old, but we, you know, <laughs> because of COVID, we we obviously didn't uh, do any touring. So, so we do that, and then just some uh, end of the year, we're still waiting to hear what's what's going to happen. But there's some other things being talked about. So um, I'll just be back to doing some teaching back home and some recording stuff, and and that's probably the year, hopefully. Excellent. Well, man, it's been a real pleasure. Um, thank you man. so much for, for taking time out of your schedule. Oh, thank you for inviting all. me to do it, man. You could have done anything in Glasgow today and you came here for a bit. I so wouldn't have it any other way. I really appreciate it. I'm really excited for tonight. Can't oh, wait to me too, back. man. Me too. Um, this one will come out in, a, in a, a couple of weeks. In fact, this one will be the next one to come out, actually. So cool. I'll, I'll send you all the, the gobbins if you, and you can do with it, as you say. Yeah, yeah. I'll but, give it um, some love, of course. Yeah, man. Um, where can people find you if they want you? Uh, at Chris Allison Drums on pretty much everything. Excellent. Uh, it's probably the easiest way to do it. Uh, Allison's got two L's. Two L's are yeah, very good. Uh, crucial. So yeah, C H R I S A W L I S O N Drums. You can all spell that. Excellent. Um, yeah, perfect. Well, beautiful. Well, I'll see you tonight, man. But thanks again. And, and next thanks time again, you're in Chris. Glasgow, we'll catch up. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thanks Take again. Care. Cheers. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Drummers Only podcast. Please leave us a review and make sure you subscribe. If you need any more information about us or any gear mentioned, head on over to drummersonly.co.uk and make sure you follow us on all of our social channels at drummersonlyuk. Thanks for listening. Peace.